Hey everybody, my name is Ryan Hill, environmental manager here at The Hideout. Thank you so much for joining me tonight. Uh, we have a really good presentation lined up for you all about spotted lanternfly. We have Diane Dippenberger of the Wayne County Master Gardener Program here in Penn State Extension to talk about this insect and its potential impact it could have here at The Hideout. So we want to make sure we're staying ahead of this, that we're educating folks on what to look for, especially if you have guests and friends coming from out of state, where they could be coming from a quarantined area that has it. So we want to try to prevent those hitchhiking um, type situations. So throughout the evening, be sure to ask questions. We do have snacks in the background. If you have a cell phone, please go ahead and silence that so it's not going off throughout the presentation, okay? But yeah, please don't be strangers. There's gonna be handouts, um, things to look at. So if you have a question for Diane, it's nice tonight to ask it. I want to turn it over to her. So, Dan, thank you. Thanks very much for having me, Ryan. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I know it's tough on a Friday evening sometimes to get people to show up, so thanks for coming. Uh, this, like, as Ryan said, spotted lanternfly is, um, is, is a, a pest that we, we, it's not here yet, but chances are fairly good that we will, in fact, see it. Um, this is what it looks like. It's actually quite beautiful. Um, right there, it's, it's really stunning. I have some, so I'll start to sh pass these around. You can look at them. These are a year old, so that a little, um, well, they're not quite as bright as they are in real life. But the pro it's interesting, when you look at them, you'll see there are two different um, ways that they're sitting. In one, in one hand, their, their arms, are, their wings are up, and then there's another pose where their wings are on their back. And um, so that's normally how you will see them is with their wings closed, like on, on one of the examples coming around. The Mass Gardener program does fall under the canopy um, of Penn State. We work with the Extension Service, and our real job is to, uh, we volunteer our services and try to extend the reach of the uh, county Extension educators. So, a little bit about the origin of, of this, or at least the origin with respect to uh, Pennsylvania. It was found, first founded in 2014 in Berks County. Is anybody from Berks County? Reading, Bucks County. Bucks County. Oh, so you, that's right, you said you thought you meant that you saw one. But down there, not up here. Okay, that's good. Um, yep. Yes, you do. Okay. Treated the trees. Yeah, you asked for them to come out. I didn't do anything. Oh, okay. Just them. somebody did. Yes. Oh, that's interesting. Okay. So maybe you can talk a little bit about later the spraying and what that is involved. Absolutely, Thank I can you. give that a whirl. Yep. So. Um, 2014 landed in Berks County prior to that. They think it actually first came to the United States in 2012 through the Philadelphia port. And it was likely, as Ryan said, they're hitchhikers. They grab onto things, they'll lay their eggs on just about anything. Um, you know, rubber tires, rust, flagpoles, cinder blocks, firewood, anything. But what they hypothesize is that they, there were some eggs on some building blocks, the building stone that came in uh, from Asia, somewhere in Asia, because that's where they're native to. They're not native to here, they are an invasive. So they landed at the port, he picked them up, took them to his landscaping business in Berks County, and we started really starting to see the population enhance in 2014. So we've been battling this for about five years. Called it a pest. What makes it a pest? Oh, well, um, it, what, the way that it, um, it has pretty significant economic um, impacts <clears throat> in Pennsylvania because it attacks the hardwoods, and where the, the Commonwealth is the number one provider of hardwoods throughout the country. And all told, from a monetary perspective in the Commonwealth, uh, we're looking at about $18 billion in lost revenue as a result of um, potential damage by spotted lantern fly. Does it, does it kill the tree or does it just make holes in the tree? What does it do? 
Well, I'm going to show you. Are you okay? Wait for a couple minutes. Okay. If I don't answer your question by the end, make sure you Take remind me. <laughs> right. Ask me again. Um, so here, the invasion process. Can you? I don't know. Can everybody see this map? Or at least the colors. Um, this is where it started, right in this area, and it branched out a little bit more. Initially, what happened is. In Berks County, they started quarantining townships. So, you know, if you're under a quarantine, basically what that means is you shouldn't move things from one area to another without first checking your vehicles and also checking what it is that you're moving. So let's say you're moving firewood from your place to a friend's place in a different township, but you're all within Berks County or within a quarantine zone. Then you need to check that you're not carrying any um, eggs or adults with you when you move from one area to the next. So as, as the quarantine townships grew, finally it was determined that it, it, it's growing at such a rate that we're going to start quarantining by counties as opposed to by township. Um, so right now, this is a little outdated. Uh, this, is, this shows 13 counties being quarantined. And in, I think, March, Dauphin was added. So now we now have 14 counties in the Commonwealth that are under quarantine. Yep. Just for reference, where are we? Oh. On this? There, here's, yeah, here's Wayne. Wayne County, All the way up here. Southern Wayne County. Yep. We, there's a better picture where we look at the whole Commonwealth as opposed to sort of just the southeastern, you know, the, the southeastern part right. of the Commonwealth. Thank you. Okay? You're welcome. Mm -hmm. um, but what's good about this, and you can see pretty easily, so here we are, this is the bottom of Wayne County. Monroe is part of the quarantine. Okay, so you don't have to go too far right now to find yourself in a quarantine area. Okay? So now you can see a little bit better that it is definitely the quarantine is, is localized or focused in the southeastern, in southeastern Pennsylvania. You have three counties in Jersey, and then there's this little satellite county over in Virginia that's also, um, there's sort of, I haven't read about like what happened, like why the, why the insects are just in that one particular county, but they haven't seen to spread. And, um, you know, in the three in Jersey, it, it's a little, not, I mean, it's not surprising given the proximity to the eastern part of Pennsylvania. So that's where we are. And again, we're up here, okay? So we'll talk a little bit about the life cycle. The good thing about the spotted lanternfly in Pennsylvania is that we only get one life cycle per year. So you know, some insects and animals, they'll breed multiple times, you know, multiple generations. We get one generation. The cold in November or December kills the adults. So the only thing that overwinters are the eggs. It's the only thing we need to worry about in the winter. So that's you know, like a little bit of a breath of relief. Um, so, whoops, sorry. So here we are, I, I have time for show and tell. Um, so the egg cases are laid in the fall, September through December, and I'll, I'll pass around some scraps. That's really what they look like, but if you look closely on each one, this is better, we'll get that. So those are the egg cases. Those are the eggs. Each egg mass has anywhere from 30 to 50 um, eggs in the mass. So we call the egg, we call them egg masses. This is right there. Some of them have fallen off, but there they are. I'm running out. Should we contain this? Excuse me? Should we contain it just in case? Yeah, right, exactly. You can preserve it any way you can. Oh, okay. Well, we'll get back. Yeah. Cycle. You can just give that or to somebody else, or you can pop it back on the table. 
Um, so start to lay eggs in uh, anywhere from September to December in, in Pennsylvania. And once she, once she lays the eggs, again, it's 30 to 50 eggs per egg mass. She covers it with a substance, sort of looks like uh, putty. It's a light colored putty. And, and the purpose of that, and here you can see it a little bit better, is to preserve the eggs and, and shelter them from the winter, from the harsh winter weather. And we'll see some actual photographs of what the egg cases and the egg masses look like in, in a couple minutes. Um, but it goes, so they, they hatch um, anywhere from May to June. And when they hatch first, you'll see they come out as a little black and white nymph. So they go through a nymph stage and there's three times it sort of sheds and grows again. So it's uh, first instar, second and third. Instars are just sort of each of those little moltings, if you will. And they're always black and white in the, those three stages. But then, they, and I only have one of these guys. Then they, they move to the fourth instar. This is another dog, you don't want to see it. And, and the fourth one is particularly striking. And we're seeing those now. Actually, we're seeing adults now, too. Um, it's right down here in the bottom left. It's, it's like a scarlet red with white spots. It's really quite beautiful. But again, uh, we see them from July to September. And then right now, I was just in Montgomery County last week and saw adults. So they're starting to come up. They're a little bit behind. I'm um, not sure why. Uh, it's unclear, but for whatever reason, they are. So the really active period for the adults is July through December. Okay? We call them spotted lantern flies, but I should just qua just sort of make sure everybody knows that they're actually leaf hoppers. They don't fly, even though they have wings. They're sort of good gliders, and they push off and glide, and they'll flap their wings, but they're really not flies. Flies. Um, Anyway, so it's just a different, it's just a different insect. So that's what the first through the third instar look like. And there is the fourth instar, and that's what's coming around right now. The adult emerges from, it's almost like a caterpillar coming out of the chrysalis. It comes, the, the, it sheds the skin, and the adult comes out of, of the fourth instar. So here is an example of the adults swarming on this tree. And this tree is the tree of heaven. And that's its preferred host. It has a number of hosts. It will feed on close to 70 plus plants. But there is a, it has a short list. And at the top of the short list is the tree of heaven. It looks very similar to sumac. And um, part of the thing that we'll do in a little bit is we'll go through how to identify a tree of heaven compared to a sumac tree, okay? And here's the female. This is the putty that I mentioned. So the eggs are right along here. She's laid the eggs, and now she's covering them. <coughs> a couple different poses of the adult wings open. Usually they open with their wings. You know, if they're, if they're jumping, they will. And also if they're um, threatened. They see, you know, they threat, they pull their wings up, and that bright red is often, you know, a danger sign to something a bird might. Birds don't seem to like them. I guess they don't taste very good because they're not, they don't feed much on them. Birds don't like them. Here's a series of egg masks, masks in the winter. You can see them up and down the tree. This looks like some kind of a birch. They do like birch trees as well. <coughs> and here we have November. You can see, they, I don't know what happened. Sometimes they miss. You know, they, she just misses covering them, and chances are those eggs will not survive just because it's too cold here. Um, and then by the time March rolls around, the, the, it looks like dried mud to me. You know, it just sort of dries out, and but that's still, you know, it's the same egg mass. They marked it when they went out to the photograph. So how do you ask how they do, how they do what they do? Um, Insects have different kinds of mouth parts. Like a fly has a, you know, it's sort of like a spongy mouth part. These guys have piercing sucking mouth parts. And the piercing sucking part is this right here. You see it? It looks like a, a um, syringe almost. And in fact, that's really what it is. 
it, it um, pierces the skin of the tree and sucks the sap from the tree. The other thing that you can note on this particular image is right down here, see this red? That indicates that this is a female. The males ha are black. The, the, the female have um, the red spot. So piercing, sucking mouth part. So that I mentioned the tree of heaven, the lanthus, and the other one, uh, similar trees, you know, in terms of its host range are the black walnut, grape, and hops. Okay, those are the primary, that's the short list. In addition, if you see a wide range of, of trees that they'll, that they'll feed on, one of the things they do not seem to feed on very much are conifers, so they don't really like evergreens. When there was some concern um, in the winter about how the, the Christmas tree farms would fare. And in fact, there was very little damage uh, by the spotted lanternfly to the to trees in the Christmas tree industry in the Commonwealth. So here they are, swarm on an apple tree. And the interesting part about this photo, I think, is that the, the insects are on the tree. They're feeding specifically and exclusively on the tree. They're not touching the fruit. All right. I guess we should take part in that, right? So this is, can you guys see this in the back? This dark, so this is on a grape leaf, it's sooty mold. Um, so the way we get sooty mold is as fast as the, Spotted lanternfly can eat the sap, which is sugary, it's sweet. It's, it's excreting it at the same time. So when that excretion, we call it honeydew, when that falls, if it falls on a leaf, for instance, um, it's very sweet and it provides like a perfect environment for mold to grow. So if it, it, will, it will produce this sooty mold on leaves, on bark, on a bicycle, on your deck, on your outdoor furniture, on the roof of your car, anywhere that it can. So that, you know, when we look at, when we try to calculate the damage, the economic loss, um, you know, I said it was around $18 billion, and there are things that are pretty easy to quantify, like on the agricultural side, then there are the intangibles, like property values. So if you live in a quarantine zone and you're having trouble with spotted lanternfly, you may have a bit of a harder time right now selling your home. So um, you ask how it damages the trees, so or the plants. So the sooty mold is growing here pretty happily, but what it's doing is it's covering up part of the leaf surface and the leaves are used to photosynthesize to produce food for the plant. So with the sooty mold covering, the plants or the leaf surface, it can't photosynthesize as well. I mean, that, this part, you know, half of the plant or a third of a plant, uh, of that leaf, is no longer able to photosynthesize. So it may not, so the, the uh, sooty mold and the uh, spotted lanternfly may not directly kill the plant, but what happens is over time, it loses vigor and then other things, other disease, makes it more susceptible to other types of damage. On the bottom um, step was power wash, and there happened to be a horticulture educator out at the time, horticulture educator, and uh, she said, wait, don't, don't do any more. I have to, well, I wanna to get to see the comparison between this nice clean step and this step and that that's covered in sooty mold. So again, that's where you know we touch on to property values and just really enjoyment of being outside. You know, it's hard to be outside when that stuff is falling on you. So this is just a little, you know, some examples of the types of um, damage that can happen to the tree over time. Um, and it's gen just generally a, a slow de demise <coughs> for, for the tree and the loss of vigor. Um, no current estimate yet for losses in apples and grapes nor in hops. Uh, they're looking into whether or not 
so, so to fight this, so I said we've been working on it for like five years, and when I say we, what I mean is the United States Department of Agriculture, the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture, and Penn State. Um, we're also working in conjunction with a couple of universities for now. Right now we're working with them to look at different pathogens that might be used to, um, to serve as a predator for it. Um, and also we're talking to folks in where it came from, so in South Korea, to see what their experiences are and how they're able to handle it. So there is a nice give and take of information, and it's, so it's not just one organization working to try to um, limit the spread of the spotted lanternfly. So um, I think there's a, there's a handout up on the, on the uh, table that talks a little bit about I mean, Pennsylvania is an agricultural state for sure, Commonwealth, and, and this is sort of where we work or where we rank in general. And you can see that, you know, the spotted lanternfly affects all of these commodities. So that's why it's such a big, um, uh, that's why we're putting so much time, energy, and funding behind trying to figure out how to contain it and, and hopefully eradicate it, but I think we're a long way from that. <coughs> I just saw a couple of days, a few days ago on TV, that they're starting to um, build bat environments that bats go in, and the bats take care of a lot of the things. Would a bat take care of this? I haven't heard of bats, like a bat box? They have, they're making it now. Now it's becoming more popular because it's right. getting rid of all the unwanted bugs that are there. Right, they love mosquitoes. Well, the, they love it a lot, they right. love a lot of insects. So would the bats be any I haven't heard better? that. I haven't heard that bats, so I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think they taste, I mean, from what you know, people have tried to figure out about them and, and looking at what they like to eat and what they don't like to eat, they really, um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of birds or bats or anything like that eating them. Nobody really seems to eat them we'll except by accident. Make the bats want to eat them. What's that? We'll spray it with something that the bats right. want to eat. Exactly, exactly, there you go. So forest projects, um, we talked about this, about $18 billion when we add it all up. And these are, you know, on the right-hand side, these are the things that are more, much more difficult to quantify. Uh, property values, tourism in Pennsylvania parks, and a lot of the state parks in southeastern Pennsylvania, folks aren't going to them because of the presence of the spotted lantern clients. It's hard to be outside. Uh, new businesses, uh, PA preferred view, group. This is sort of interesting because, you know, uh, Pennsylvania has had has seen an increase, a sort of a, a blooming increase in craft breweries, mm -hmm. and because the spotted lanternfly is uh, the or hops are, is one of their primary hosts, it makes it a little bit difficult for that industry to use, to grow hops locally, and when they're um, one of the primary hosts. We actually looked. We had a conversation. I don't know a couple months ago now uh, with the. Wayne Conservation District about and, and Penn State about you know having hop putting hops yards in in Wayne County because there's some you know excess farmland and people are looking for different crops and it was determined that probably right now for a number of reasons including the spotted lanternfly hops probably are not a good um, cash crop for you know Wayne County farmers to get into we don't have any processing facilities here and um, just. On, on hold, but it is it is an area of concern when you look at the economics of it. So, how what do we do? You know, what's our role? How do we help? So, there are a number of things that we can do. Um, there is a brochure. There's a, a handout back on the table that goes over these things too. So, we'll we'll go through these, and if you have any questions, um, just you know, let me know. So the first thing and sort of the easiest thing to do, and it's something that all of us can do, is, is to, when we see egg masses on trees, if we're out taking a walk in the woods or wherever on our own property, um, smash them. You can, you can smash them on the tree. You can take um, a scraper. Uh, you can use a, like a credit card. I had, uh, I think I brought some scrapers. And get a little baggie, put some alcohol or some hand sanitizer in it, have your credit card or a little similar card. You can even use a stick, but just scrape the egg case, the egg mask, into a container, and and that would kill them. 
stop the spread. I talked about this with respect to the firewood. So if you're moving, how many people go back and forth between the quarantine zone and up here? Anybody have a place? Yeah, Montgomery County. You're in the thick of it. You're, yeah. So what you should do is check things before you, especially if you're down there, coming back up here. Check your car. Check. They like wheel wells. They'll hang out in, the adults will hang out in there. there we found egg cases, so our egg masses. So come, you know, the winter, September, soon when they start laying, just make sure that you, you know, check your vehicle. We have a checklist later that you can look at to see what you should be aware of. Yeah, this is a good one right here. Don't park under infested trees. Leave your windows rolled up. I had a friend who was in Montgomery County. She got out, um, she actually, she lives there. And she opened her mailbox and it was filled with spotted lanternflies. It's like, you know, you can't really get away. And she works with them on a daily basis. So there they were in her mailbox. This is a cinder block there you can see, some egg masses. Um, old posts, also egg masses that we found them on old tires. Um, and like I said earlier, rusted things. They really, they really don't care, it seems, where they lay them. They're not particular. They're opportunistic when it comes to laying their eggs. This is the fourth instar, bright red. In, on the, so, so the wheel, the, here they're clearly on the tire, on the rim, and up in the wheel well itself. You may see these signs now. In the quarantine area, they're putting signs up um, to make sure that you look before you leave, just to remind people that they should have, they should do a quick walk around, get your car washed, whatever it is, but you know, just check for it. If you find it, kill it. Here's the scraping of the eggs. <coughs> One of the times I was at the hideout, maybe it was last time, the, week, the time before, Ryan, you had some guys from one of the local hunt um, Yes, Wildwood clubs. Hunting Club, yep. Right. Um, and so, which is great. So, Center County, a lot of places are, are, you know, sort of mobilizing people who spend fair amounts of time in the woods. They're educating them about the spotted lantern fly so that when they go out, if they see the egg cases, they can, they know what to do. They know to kind of identify them, scrape them, and kill them. So this is um, another way that you can catch these guys, particularly the nymphs. So just when they're the, you know, one through four instars, the little guys, you can put these sticky tapes around, or sticky bands around the tree. And what happens is the nymphs tend to go up the tree looking for food. They like to eat like the new leaves. So they'll, they'll go up, but the sticky tape is perfect because they're tiny insects and they'll, they'll walk on this and get stuck. So there's a, a program throughout the quarantine area where you can actually get, through PBA, uh, you can get sticky bands, uh, mark your location, you check your track, your bands every week or so, you do count and report that back to PDA so they can keep track of the population. I have drown, dry mouth, which is why I drink all the time. It's not vodka, it's just water. <laughs> we won't say about this. <laughs> Thank you, I appreciate that. <coughs> but, um, but so one of the drawbacks of these sticky bands is that you can catch bigger things. Some people have reported catching small birds, butterflies, moths. You know, you couldn't even catch something, you know, like a field mouse. Um, so what the... Master Gardeners in Berks County, which is sort of the epicenter of this, round zero, is they shorten the, the, decrease the width of the band. So the bands that you get from PDA are maybe a foot. And so they decrease them to about half that. And then they wrap one inch chicken wire around it. And that helps to keep the bigger things off of the sticky bands and reduces what they call bycatch. Another thing that you can do is you don't have to use these sticky tapes. Some people use uh, duct tape. So they just you know wrap it around with the sticky side on the outside, and that works pretty well too. And in some cases, uh, you can, depending upon what it is, like if, maybe if it's a narrow tree, a small tree, a small caliper tree, people are using petroleum jelly on it too because they can't climb through it, they can't get through it. 
what we do ask is if, if somebody you know somebody or if you do this yourself and you you catch an animal um, be, ideally you should take it to call animal control don't try to deal with it yourself but um, we don't see a lot of that actually happening that's actually are one of the things that they have seen that so the other thing you can do is try to remove as much as you can its number one host, and that's the tree of heaven. And it's typically a trash plant, if you will. It's also an invasive. Um, it came from Asia. And you'll see it alongside the road. And so what we're going to do is, there's a fact sheet on the table. I'd encourage you, if you're interested, to, to take it and read it because it really talks about how to identify it and how to get rid of it. But I brought some samples, so I'm just going to um, hand them out. So one of the things about the, the Tree of Heaven is that it is very similar to sumac, which is what we said earlier, right? So, so one of the identifying characteristics of sumac I got quite a stash. Is um is that cone on top, right? That flower on the top. This is the tree of heaven. Hold that guy for me. Thanks. So this is sumac. Um, this is tree of heaven. Very. When you see them side by side, and they have their seed pods on, it's pretty easy to see the difference. But if you don't have the seed pod, okay, so you are getting, why don't you just take some of those leaves off? Just rip the whole thing. Yep, you can have one. Take yours off. You can pass around. I want everybody to have some so you can see, because we're going to talk about the differences in the leaves. Because that is an excellent way to identify what you have. Spotted lanternfly. It's a tick. It's a tick. Oh, uh, uh, I think it's a tick. Oh, oh spider. It is. Yeah. You know better than me. Well, I don't like either. So. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So um, there are a couple ways to identify it, and this is all set forth in the Tree of Heaven fact sheet. But we'll just run over them so that you have some idea of what you're looking at. This is the bark, so in the winter, if you want to try to identify it, it's sort of what we call cantaloupe bark. If you think of it as the outside of a cantaloupe, it has sort of this netting. That's what this is. Um, on the leaf, they're both, both leaves are pretty similar. So this entire piece is called the leaf. These little guys are leaflets in the world of horticulture. <coughs> um, we'll, just call, we'll just call them leaf for now. Um, what's important is this. So this is the tree of heaven. You see this little notch? And if you have a tree of heaven leaf on your table, you should see you have either one or two of these little notches at the base of the leaflet. That's called a dog tooth. If you 
compare that with a sumac leaf, you'll see that the sumac leaf doesn't have that. Okay? So if you don't have a seed pod, but you see the leaf that looks like this and you're not sure what it is, this is one way that you can hopefully um, tell the difference. And why would you want to tell the difference? Why do you care? Burn. Burn them. Well, you might want to get rid of them and we're going to talk about the best and the safest way to get rid of them and the most efficient way so that they don't um, so that they don't continue to grow because basically what these do, if you just cut them down, the tree of heaven, they sucker. They think they're under attack, so they'll send up suckers. So um, in, the, in the handout, it will tell you that what you need to do is first treat the plant with a systemic herbicide. So you spray it, it's systemic, it goes into the vascular system of the plant and wait about 30 days, you know, during those 30 days, the herbicide infiltrates the plant down to the roots, and then you can cut it down, and um, you will have killed the roots so it can't sucker, it won't sucker. Okay, if you just go out and chop it down, it'll sucker and, you, and it, make it makes it even worse. So they need to be treated first with an herbicide. Wait, my ex -wife. Okay, no comment, we'll move on. Um, they also have this peanut, they both have this peanut buttery thing in the middle. And some people think it smells like rancid peanut butter. It has a little heart-shaped leaf scar on it, on the, on the stem. And again, these are the dead, I thought I brought one of these, I don't see it now. Um, these are the dead uh, seed pods up here. So in the winter, you can easily identify the trees as well, either through the bark with the cantaloupe or the, the seeds, like the seed pods like this. I think it's this. right over there on that table. Oh, is it? I think so. There's something like that. No, I don't see it. But thank you for checking. So, when people talk about, you know, they just want to spray something. That's sort of the easiest way. Just get rid of it, be done with it, right? Um, there is a whole management um, program that you can use by month in the um, homeowner's guide, the management guide on the table. And it will go through uh, different if sort of the the decision tree on what type of control would be most appropriate for the population of spotted lanternfly that you have. And generally, the insecticides and pesticides are at the very top of that triangle. It's called an integrated pest management triangle, where you start at the lowest level, you know, the bottom, you like pick you individually kill them, you mechanically kill them, um, and, and go forward. So insecticides are certainly one tool in the toolbox, but they are sort of on the top shelf, the last thing that you would use. Some folks use home remedies. There's, an, you know, I mean, there are home remedies for everything, you know, sort of the do-it-yourselfers. So one of the problems with, with using that, one of the drawbacks is that not everybody's using the same thing. There's really not a recipe. There's no good information about what it will do to beneficial insects, for instance, or what about your pets. So um, the best thing is, you know, that that we ask folks not to use home remedies because there are other alternatives. And so here are some of the things that people have used: uh, gasoline, WD-40. Alcohol. Now, alcohol we use for the egg cases. When we talked about scraping the eggs into the egg cases or into the baggies, um, or uh, oops, I lost that guy. Uh, just different kind, kinds of detergent. So, what we would say is, please don't use you know any home remedies. Consult you know with your extension person or do some online research and find out exactly what it is that you have and make sure it is a spotted lantern fly. This really goes for any insect. You know, I was walking with somebody the other day and there were um, some bugs on the ground and she's like, just get something and spray them. And I said, well, what are they? Oh, I don't know, just spray them. So, you know, there's that, that, that feeling that if it's on the ground, it's an insect, we should probably kill it. But in fact, there's so many beneficial insects. That's really, it's really good to know what the target is. Know what, know what you're dealing with. Um, so again, there are 
insecticides that you can use. There are organic ones and there are you know, sort of inorganic ones and all of that information is in one of the little charts on the table and we can look at it. This is a very good way to do, um, to try to control them as well. This is called the trap tree method. And what happens is that you have a, if you have a grove of, let's say of the tree of heaven, the preferred host, what you want to do is keep two or so and kill everybody else. So, and remember the way that you do that is you first have to spray it with an herbicide and then wait 30 days and then take it down. And what you're going to do is treat the trap trees with a systemic pesticide that's labeled for use for spotted lanternfly. So because it's a uh, um, systemic, the leaves take it in, it's the same thing, it goes into the vascular you know, part of the tree and when the spotted lanternfly starts to feed on it, it becomes poisoned and dies. Biological control. Um, we don't have any biological control yet, but Penn State is working with uh, a PhD person up at Cornell and they're looking at a couple different um, biologic controls, uh, some of a fungal nature and also others of a, a like a parasitic wasp. It's actually, they're looking at the wasp that was used to um, help fight the gypsy moth. It's still a long way off. So there are some there are some insects though that will eat it. That will eat the, the um, spotted lanternfly, but you know they eat anything. So again, it's not a targeted uh, decision or a targeted way to address the pest, the insect. Again, on long, ongoing research, um, trying to look at the short and long term, long term effects of the spotted lanternfly on the host crops, both the primary and the secondary. Um, lures and attractants, and so they're trying to figure out whether, you know, we have the Japanese beetle trap, it'd be great if we had the same thing for a spotted lanternfly. Hang them up, Bob's your uncle. Um, so I think that, I mean, you can obviously read this, but again, I think the point is that it's a three-prong approach from USDA, PVA, and Penn State, and then other universities as, as well. This is the quarantine. We talked about this. This does not include Dolphin County, which I think is like right here. So, um, but we haven't, they, they were added in March. People are saying the population is down just a little bit, not sure why. Um, so one of the cool things that, that the Pennsylvania Department of Ag has, you know, people have said, how do I know if I'm in a quarantine zone or not? So you can put, you can go to their website actually, and you can put in your address or your zip code and it will tell you if you're in a quarantine zone. So that's useful for if you're taking a walk in the woods, you think you're gonna look for them, not a bad idea to know whether or not you're actually in a quarantine area, and also just for the travel back and forth. If you're taking a walk in an area that's quarantined um, or not quarantined, you should check your vehicles and then you'll know. So I think we sort of talked about most of this. So what does it mean to be in a quarantine area? You know, for, for, for uh, Let's say it means one thing for business owners. It means another thing for or business owners that travel in and out. We'll talk about the whole permitting process, but also uh, just for you know, like us in our everyday lives, it's really just being aware of the movement, like what's going on around you, and if you're moving things from one area to the other, just to check to make sure. This is the checklist that I mentioned. It's available on all these documents are available online, and Ryan, I'll give you the link so that you can give them to folks if they, you can just send them the link. They can print it themselves or whatever, okay? So this is the permitting process. It started in the spring. If you have a business that um, goes in and out of their travels around in a quarantine area, you are asked to, required actually now, to uh, go through an online test, uh, an informational uh, section and then a quiz and it, so let's say you have a nursery business, you travel and you have like five folks that work for you, a couple of trucks. One person in your organization takes the test and then it's a, a teach the teacher kind of experiment, you know, model. So that person that gets the permit 
go back, sell, shares the knowledge with everybody. So not everybody has to take it. It is free and you get a sticker that you need to have. You have to have evidence that you have taken, that you have a permit. Um, if they are now pulling people over, you know, to check if they're, if they see a nursery person in a quarantine zone, traveling with, with goods or sort of goods, um, to check, they want to look for their permit. I don't think yet they've started to enforce the fines, but there are fines. I think it's up to $20,000 if you're not permitted. So it's, a, I mean, you know, I mean, that goes back to the $18 billion, you know, I mean, it's not, it, it's not an insignificant issue. There are lots of places where you can get information online about spotted lantern fraud. So this is the, um, this is over on the table, but it gives you a map of sort of, you know, best, best management and practices <coughs> part of the year. So when you have the eggs, you know, the nymphs, the eggs, the eggs, the nymphs, the adults. It's really something for you to do year round for the spotted lantern fly. If you think that you have seen a spotted lantern fly, um, we ask that even if you're in a quarantine zone, so we, they know that they're there obviously, we ask that you still call in to the 888 for that fly number and just let them know. You can also report this online, you can do it online. If you're outside the quarantine zone, even more important that you let people know that you think you saw a spotted lantern fly. Some folks aren't quite sure, but um, the calls go to the USDA and the USDA will go out and check, or PDA, they will go out and check um, calls and that have, of reported sightings. So it is very important people go and actually check it out. So that's all I have. Does any, are there any other questions? Everybody good? Uh-huh. they bite people? Now, good question. They do not bite. No. Only if you have sap. Right. Like a mosquito. Mm -hmm. They have the same kind of proboscis, that's right, that, that tiny thing, but, but no, they, they only attack um, trees or vines or vines, you know, so, yeah, it's good they don't bite us, they look for nasty, but they're gorgeous, but they're really a menace. Anybody else have any questions? Do you work in Wackalaxon too? I do not, I only work in Wayne County. Were you ever there? I, uh, yes. During uh, one of the classes, uh, the kids, you were talking to them about something? Hmm. I don't think I have been down there. I mostly just work in, I work out of the Wayne, um, out of the Homesdale office. Okay. But it's good that they're doing that sort of thing. Yeah. Anybody else? Thank you. Yeah.